The context for, for this paper and for this talk is this. As Charlie mentioned, I have been in the, in the dispute resolution world for a couple of decades. I've been in legal education for a couple of decades. And, um, and, and really, I spent, I've, 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 I've sort of, um, well, I used to pay my bills entirely based on understanding how people m make deals and resolve disputes. That was sort of, that's my profession. And it only recently, and I mean really comparatively very recently, occurred to me that I had spent most of this 20 years studying things that went well, people who did good things. Um, and that stands in stark contrast to so much of what we do in law school, where we study stories with, happy, with unhappy endings. Right? We study for, not just for, for voyeuristic, rubbernecking reasons, but for, for educational reasons. We have this notion that if we study contracts that were drafted badly, or we study um, torts that commit, people commit on each other, we'll learn something from that in a way that is instructive. And it occurred to me that, that I had never really read much about lawyers negotiating badly. Even though by every reasonable assessment, it's a big part of what lawyers do these days is to negotiate. And in particular, in the context of lawyers whose practices center around dispute resolution, I had, I had read virtually nothing about lawyers messing up a, a dispute resolution process in spite of the fact that some gigantic percentage of litigated cases are resolved through some form of consensual settlement process. Um, and so I went looking. And, um, and the article that, um, that is coming out this fall, it's available online if you dig a lot, but it'll be easier to find in about a month, um, makes, uh, makes one empirical contribution that is this. Um, I studied uh, 16,000 lawsuits filed against lawyers. So these are malpractice cases over 10 years in 11 jurisdictions. So it's an unwieldy database and for the for the social scientists in the crowd, happy to talk methods. I don't think it's probably the best digestion aid for today, but if you want to talk methods, I am so in on that. Studied about 16,000 malpractice cases filed against lawyers. And, uh, it, and at least in these, um, in these cases, less than 1% of those 16,000 cases involved a claim by a client that his or her lawyer did something wrong in the context of settlement. There were a, I felt naive reading some of these cases. I had no idea the creative ways in which lawyers could screw up almost everything related to representing clients. I mean, just the entrepreneurially bad lawyering going on uh, across the country, and yet fewer than 1% of them had anything to do with lawyers engaging in alleged malpractice in the context of settlement. So then I studied about 8,000 ethics complaints against lawyers uh, again, over a decade, uh, this time uh, r roughly similar number of jurisdictions, thinking, well, maybe clients who are mad at their lawyers for settlement-related reasons don't sue, they file bar complaints. Right? The standards are slightly different, the barriers are slightly different, but it was at least another way of trying to get at it because this number, frankly, shocked me. And it turns out it was about one and a half percent of ethics complaints filed against lawyers relate in any way to the lawyer's conduct in the context of settlement. Again, in contrast to the gigantic percentage of cases that are resolved through settlement, these numbers seem off. 
the third thing I did, just because, just again, this didn't seem, this seemed wrong. Um, but I am asserting to you, at least for purposes of today, to, I invite you to, to believe me that these are what the data say. Um, I then studied um, a handful of different state bar ethics advisory opinions. You know, sometimes uh, if a lawyer has a question about whether a rule applies in a particular way, then you advice about how this fits with that. They can file questions, and sometimes there's a, there's a mechanism in each state bar for issuing advice about what an opinion means or doesn't, and it's in a particular context. And so I thought, well, maybe there, and it's roughly similar. It's uh, in all but one jurisdiction that I studied, it was less than 2% of them had anything to do with settlement-related lawyer conduct. And so some immediate questions based on this empirical claim that I am making. Um, I suppose question number one should be, is that true? I'm saying yes, it is. But again, happy to talk about the methods I used for arriving at that conclusion. Maybe more importantly, um, if that's true, why? What explanation or explanations would plausibly produce a context in which it is unarguably true that lawyers spend a bunch of their time doing this thing, and it is, I am asserting, true that clients don't complain about that thing. And I'm not making an argument that there are too few or too many complaints against lawyers. There, um, nationwide data, it's, it's about point eight claims per thousand lawyers a year. That's sort of like, it's, it's, it's not very common, but it's not unheard of for lawyers to get complained about. And, and my beef is not, that my, I'm not saying that number is too high or too low. I'm saying it's weird that the ratio of complaints that are filed against lawyers is so dramatically low with respect to this aspect of lawyering in proportion to how important that is to lawyering. So, so why might this be true is another question. Um, a third lapses into the normative. How should we feel about these numbers? Um, and different of my colleagues um, have different feelings about them. Uh, and then a fourth question would be, regardless of how we feel about them, if they are true, are these numbers likely to persist? And so, um, so here's the, um, to, to go to the why. Why do these things come out this way? Here's my, um, here's the, the basic argument that I am making in the paper. I am making the argument in this paper that the malpractice system, systems really, but for purposes of this, let's simplify it to say there's one malpractice system, that the malpractice system in the lawyering context was designed with lawyers as litigators in mind. It makes some basic assumptions about lawyering and about clients and their interests that are reasonable in the context of litigation malpractice that may not serve us well or may not align well with the realities of lawyers doing things other than litigating. And so I'm going to suggest that there are three assumptions baked into our legal malpractice system. One assumption is, has something to do with judgmental deference. That is the notion that we don't want, we are, we are unwilling to re-examine every little strategic decision a lawyer makes. Should I call this witness or that witness? Should I ask this question on cross or that on cross? Should I do it in this sequence? Should I? There's just too much bound up in litigation for us to tolerate the, the second guessing. And so we will, for lawyers in litigation, essentially say, we're not even going to ask. If your complaint is that your lawyer did a bad job of asking that question of that witness, good luck to you. As a system, we've decided that's not worth the potential shenanigans and costs associated with. That's one assumption. Second assumption that we make 
is that a lawyer's malpractice, if a lawyer commits some error, that malpractice will result in a worse trial outcome or trial expectation. Right? If a lawyer messes something up in litigating, our, our system assumes that the result of that error will be that her client is less likely to win at trial or she's likely to do less well at trial in terms of dollars. Um, right? that, 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 that the error will be reflected in the outcome of the trial. And the third assumption that is made is that a client's interests related to the representation are, are defined by trial outcomes, that is, by the remedial powers of the court. What the client wanted is what the court could have granted. I don't, I'm not sure I have a beef with any of these three if what we're talking about is litigation malpractice. I, I can see why we don't want to engage in the intolerably speculative second guessing. I can see why we would want to use the case within a case mechanism for assessing whether something was malpractice or not, right? That's what this hinges on. The notion is, if my lawyer messed up, then at trial against my lawyer for malpractice, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, here's how this litigated case would have come out if, I, if my lawyer had been minimally competent, right? So you do the case within a case. And then what we do is we compare the outcome that I actually got with the outcome that I would have gotten. That's not a, it's certainly a defensible system. And I think it has served us more and less well in the context of litigation, but I think it is largely to explain these numbers with rela in relation to settlement. And so what I thought I would do is, um, is share with you, again, I looked at 24,000 different complaints against lawyers, and by I, I mean my research assistants and I, and by that, I mean my research assistants. Um, that's not true. I did a lot of looking. I read a lot of cases. Um, and they read more. Um, what I thought I would do uh, to stimulate your thinking in our conversation is I thought I would share three cases with you. Um, actual cases. These are not hypos that a law professor cooked up for a final exam. These are like real live cases. Well, they were alive. They're dead now in the sense that they've been resolved, but they're actual human beings, actual cases. And they aren't the sort of parade of horribles cases. These are three cases that give me pause. These are hard cases, but I think they are hard in ways that are illustrative of the dynamics that I'm describing here. And so, um, so let me just describe them to you. Um, I'm going to leave some space here because I'm going to come back to that. Case number one. Um, the client in this case is the defendant in a piece of commercial litigation. The plaintiffs in the case made an offer to the client's lawyer to settle the case for $450,000 and control over some one of the contested companies. The details of the offer aren't super important. What's important to know is that the plaintiffs in the case made this offer to the cl clients, uh, to the defendant's attorney. The attorney never conveyed that offer to the client. The case went to trial and um, and the client defendant uh, lost at trial. All right. Subsequent to losing at trial, the client defendant learned of the $450,000 offer and brought a malpractice action against um, his attorney. All right. In a simple case, 
the client here would have said in deposition and then again on the stand to the question, what would you have done had you heard about this $450,000 offer? The simple case, the client says, well, I would have taken it. In fact, the client in this case said, well, I mean, I definitely would have, it would have been clear that they were open to negotiating and I don't know, I, I, I would have told my lawyer to go see if he could do even better. That's not an unreasonable thing for a client to say. In fact, we might look with some skepticism about a client who accepts the first offer that he receives, right? As a negotiation matter, depending on the context, it might be that the client was not only perfectly honest in deposition, but strategically appropriate. The attorney in the malpractice action of client versus lawyer, having heard that, um, moved for summary judgment. And fast forward, the Texas Supreme Court agreed that the plaintiff, the client here, could not recover. Even though, unarguably, the lawyer never conveyed this offer to the client. The, the Texas Supreme Court's logic essentially boiled down to, geez, can we really, can we really speculate about what would have happened in a world in which a client knew something? Gosh, says the Texas Supreme Court, that seems like a lot of guesswork. It seems like it opens the door for a lot of self-serving testimony. And we're just not sure we're willing to engage in the, the speculative enterprise of the what would have happened in this negotiation like that. What the Texas Supreme Court did not say explicitly, because they were not invited to, for reasons I don't understand. Implied, though, in what they are saying, I will point out, is although every articulation of legal ethics that exists and every articulation of agency that exists places theoretical value on a client's choice, right? We defend the notion of self-determination and autonomy and informed consent by our clients, what the Texas Supreme Court said was that's actually worth zero. It is an uncompensable thing. That's case one. Case two um, involves a divorce. In this case, it was a, uh, a husband and a wife. And um, the client of interest to me here is uh, the wife. Um, her attorney, probably lawyer is easier, the client wife, her lawyer came and said, I've negotiated what I think is a pretty good deal. I advise you to take it. And she looked at the deal and said, there's some dispute about whether she said, grumble, grumble, okay, or whether she said, grumble, grumble, full stop. Her lawyer communicated to the other side that she had accepted the terms of the deal. Right? And we could have a factual fight about whether she did or didn't. What she learned shortly after this was that it was, quote, ridiculously inadequate. These are her words, not mine. She, didn't, she came to believe that the deal was in fact substantively a terrible deal. And so she fired her attorney and then she hired two attorneys, right? One for the wife versus husband divorce and one for the wife versus lawyer 
uh, legal malpractice claim. Okay? I am plainly more interested in this one. Her second or third, depending on how you count them, lawyer negotiated the terms of a slightly different divorce than the original one, but it was clearly based on the original deal about which there was some argument whether there was a deal or not. Her second lawyer made it a little bit better, and, and in some jurisdictions, when you, um, uh, when you want to uh, finalize the terms of a divorce, you go into court, and there is an exchange with the judge, a colloquy of sorts, where the judge will assure herself of some aspects of the agreement before signing off on it. This is not the case in all kinds of civil settlements, but in many divorce contexts, this is, this is how that works. And so there was a colloquy between the, um, the court and the client, whose name was Kathleen Buchel. And in the interests of vocal diversity, and because I cannot show you the colloquy, I'm going to ask for maybe the two of you, if you could volunteer to be the court and the client so that we can hear. If you could just read for the group the colloquy, that would be great. Client, I'll be the, you be the court. All right. So, okay, you're telling me that you have discussed this settlement with your attorney and that you think it's a fair compromise of the issues, is that accurate? Yes. You probably feel you're not getting as much as you want. I'm sure your husband feels he's paying more than he should, and if that's true, it's probably a test of fair compromise. I ask you one more time, are you accepting this compromise voluntarily? Yes. All right. And then? We have Kathleen's attorney. And then we have Kathleen's attorney, who happens conveniently to be sitting next to you. <laughs> And I've explained to you that I spoke to your attorney in the malpractice case against your former attorney and with the pro proviso, I'll just place on the record, it is your understanding that entering into this agreement will not prejudice you in that case, correct? It's my correct understanding. So that your understanding is by entering into the agreement, you are still preserving any and all claims you have against your former attorney in connection with her, reputation, her representation of you in the matrimonial action. Yes. There, that's a colloquy. I mean, the real colloquy is like 10 times as long. But substantively, that's the colloquy. And that is the transcript of the colloquy in that case. The colloquy completed. The court said, fine. Got out the official judicial rubber stamp. The divorce was finalized. And the next day, the wife's lawyer moved to dismiss the legal malpractice action on the basis that the client had testified during that colloquy. I don't know if you've heard it or not, but, but part of what was said was, what was the quote? It was a fair compromise. A fair compromise. She told the court it was a fair compromise because she had to tell the court it was a fair compromise. Had she not said it was a fair compromise, the court would not have granted her the divorce. Now, former lawyer sweeps in and says, you just told the court you got a fair outcome. No one deserves better than fair under the law. You suffered no injury. This one was not in Texas, this was in New Jersey. The New Jersey State Bar Association, this went all the way up to the New Jersey Supreme Court, the New Jersey State Bar Association weighed in, filing an amicus brief in support of the lawyer's proposition that the wife's claim should be dismissed. They argued that to do otherwise would dampen the likelihood of settlement as an empirical matter, I think that assertion is challengeable, but, but they, they made that argument. They made the argument that uh, 
that it would that it would that it would interfere with lawyers' willingness to advise their clients to settle. And again, it's not a brief onto which I would have signed because it's not clear to me that settlement malpractice reliably comes in the form of urging bad settlements. It can just as easily come in the form of urging rejection of good settlements. And as a public policy matter, I can't intuit why we would be in favor of one of those two kinds of mischief as opposed to the other. But the New Jersey Supreme Court filed this amicus brief, and the New Jersey Supreme Court agreed, and the client here could recover nothing from the attorney. Just a factual. So the, the colloquy happens in the course of the second case where the client says it's a fair compromise of the divorce. Of the divorce. And was there any substantive difference between that? I thought you said it was. There was some difference. She this didn't even get her attorney's fees for the incremental improvement? She did not. I think you could make an argument that she could have stood to get her second attorney's fees, the increment. I suspect strongly on the Texas Supreme Court logic that they would have said, we're not sure this one was inadequate below the fair standard, right? This one's unarguably better, but were you as a matter of law legally entitled to better than this? You got better than this, but we wouldn't have overturned this had it been 10% one direction or another. Why would we reward you? It is a, it is a um, when I am under caffeinated or cynical, it is a, it is a jaw-droppingly self-protective combination of factors our profession has created for itself in this context. Um, third case. Uh, the third case involves uh, the, the client here is uh, a doctor who has a lawyer. And the doctor was accused of um, some medical malpractice. Um, that was, uh, all medical malpractice is bad, I'm not here to speak, but it is apparently not super significant as medical malpractice goes. And my, and my reason for saying that is that the lawyer came back to uh, her client here and said, um, look, I've been negotiating uh, a possible resolution of this claim, um, and uh, the deal that is being offered is 2,500 bucks, which for you and me matters, but in the scope of medical malpractice claims, that's not as many digits as one might normally expect to see. And the client, the doctor said, and, and I should note, this was with um, the Connecticut Department of Health. I did not cherry pick this case for today's presentation. It just is interesting. And, um, and the doctor said to his lawyer, okay, I mean, 2,500 bucks, you cost me more than that, so I'm not so worried about that. I do want to be clear, though, I only practice in Connecticut once in a while. Most of my practice is in California and in Florida. This isn't going to mess anything up, is it? And the lawyer said, no, absolutely not. This is of essentially no import, said the lawyer to the doctor. And so the doctor agreed. It settled. And the next week, both California and Florida barred the doctor from practice under reciprocal discipline. Not surprisingly, we now have the case of doctor versus lawyer in a legal malpractice case, right? Uh, 
unlike the first two cases, this one went through federal court. The Civ Pro junkies in the room can imagine why. The federal court in this case dismissed the client's claim. It was unarguably true that this was going to have impacts on the reciprocal discipline. Reciprocal discipline was not invented in the interstices here. It, any modicum of research would have revealed that agreeing to this punishment in one state was going to have an effect in other states. But they dismissed the legal malpractice claim against the lawyer. And the logic went like this. We have to look at the but-for world. Had the lawyer not given this crappy legal advice, what would have happened, right? That's the standard, right, in a tort action. What would have happened? Well, says the, the court in dismissing the case, what would have happened is that the Connecticut Department of Health would have gone after this doctor for this unsettled claim. And the doctor here has not been able to prove that he was more than 50% likely to win had the Connecticut court, Connecticut Department of Health gone after him. So, says the federal court, the client suffered no injury because the client got exactly the outcome the client would have gotten anyway, which is the client would have been barred in Florida and California. No harm here, says the, says the court. In, um, in Connecticut. There is, and I don't know if you've run into it in, in other contexts or in other classes, there is in the medical context and in, in a few other contexts, some states will permit what is called the loss of chance doctrine. Right? The notion is that if you go in with a, um, um, if you go into a doctor with um, <coughs> With a condition, the doctor mistakenly, uh, the doctor misdiagnoses the condition, and the result is you might have had a 30% chance of surviving this cancer if you had gotten at it right away, but in fact, because the doctor missed it, that reduced to 3%. Is that a compensable injury the doctor has just caused upon you? Some states say yes. In the, in the medical context, on the notion that the client, the patient, has lost that opportunity. It's not that there was a likelihood, but there was an opportunity, and that is compensable in the medical context. But I'm aware of none of our 50 states that has extended the loss of chance doctrine to lawyers. Again, depending on caffeine and cynicism, one could imagine why that might be. It is surely the case that a part of the challenge is that establishing precise likelihoods is difficult. It is, in fact, so difficult that I think it's a defensible public policy position to say it's so hard we shouldn't make things ride on it. But if that's true, the cost of saying, ooh, too difficult, we're not going to do it, the policy result is that if you have a 40% winner case, it is impossible for a lawyer to commit compensable malpractice on you. And particularly given the population of cases for which that might be true, I think that there are some access to justice questions that might properly be raised because the population of people with claims that are not facially awful but maybe not greater than 50% winners is not a random collection of claimants. And I think that there are policy reasons why we, why we might be troubled about some of these. Again, I will point out that the Connecticut court here is adopting the notion that what is compensable is a lot of things, but not 
choice. Right? Embedded in the federal court's logic here is that what we are comparing is the result the client would have obtained with the result the client obtained. And there is no separate valuation of the notion that this doctor client might have wanted the chance to roll the dice. The court says that's uncompensable. So, um, last thing that I will uh, do is, uh, and then I'd love to invite questions and, uh, and talk about all this. I want to revisit this. If, um, if this system makes sense in litigation, what would need to look different about it for it to, look, to make sense in a settlement context for lawyers. And I think that there are a couple things I would observe. The first is we needn't have one blanket level of deference for all decisions that lawyers make. It may make sense for us to have this very high level of deference for what I'll call strategic negotiation judgments. Should I offer 1.2 or 1.4? Should I offer it in my office or your office on Thursday or on Friday? That feels very much like the kind of um, litigation, strategic, interactively strategic, right? What I decide to do depends on what I think you're going to do and how you're going to react to what I do. Right? It's got that aspect. But that's different in my mind than the higher scrutiny that I suggest would be appropriate for what I will call settlement advice. Settlement advice, by the nature of the agency relationship, should not be strategic. You should be providing your very best advice to your client about the risks and opportunities associated with litigation, about how that intersects with your interests, the, the, the ends of the represent goals of the representation, about the implications of potential settlement options, right? That stuff, whatever else it might be, is not supposed to be strategic because we assume an alignment of the interests of the lawyer and the client. And in that context, I can't see why we would have the same deference. So that's, that's one assertion. Second assertion that I would make about um, about the result being in, in, in the trial malpractice context is I think that right now courts are conflating a case's litigation value and its settlement value. One is surely a function of the other, right? The settlement value of a case is surely the function of the expected outcome at trial adjusted, risk adjusted for transaction costs and others, right? That's sort of classic economics. But the settlement value of a case is not the same as a litigation value. If th there was one, one of the cases that I studied was one in which um, uh, so, so, sort of like case number two, the shocking number of cases actually, where a lawyer signaled acceptance or something where the client said, I did no such thing. I never said I would take that deal. Let's say a lawyer, mistakenly, not strategically, just plain old unarguable error, slip of tongue, in a settlement negotiation says to the other side, yeah, I mean, my client said she'd be willing to do anything in the north of 25000 but didn't have authority to say that. Just total mistake. The injury caused to the client by that lawyer's slip of tongue, by that revealing of the confidence, is that the lawyer has just harmed the settlement value of the case. Right? The lawyer has just made it vanishingly unlikely that the other side is going to offer a bunch more than 25000 the lawyer has done nothing to the litigation value of the case. That utterance, as erroneous as it may have been, will have no impact on what 
happens at trial. And so if we have a system that conflates the two, I think there is mischief to be done. The last of these things is, um, not surprisingly, I think that there are, um, there are pieces of clients' interests that are not well captured in our current malpractice system. I'll name three. One is there are a lot of non-zero sum. There, there are a lot of, uh, of, of, of value creating aspects to well-negotiated deals, right? It can be done in a way that is tax smart. It can be done in a way that capitalizes on differences in risk preferences or predictions or resources and capabilities or time horizons, right? There are ways to structure deals that make it better than just a zero sum. None of that gets captured in a traditional litigation malpractice case for the good reason that litigation outcomes are, in fact, zero sum. But settlement need not be and, in fact, should not be. We need to take advantage of that. The second is a lot of settlement decisions are probabilistic decisions. Right? They are judgments based on likelihoods, either likelihoods, uh, assessments of what might happen at trial, what might happen in the future. Right? A lot of cases have contingent clauses that are essentially bets that one person is making about what will or won't happen, about risk allocation and things like that. Our system, current system, doesn't, doesn't acknowledge their existence creating some apples to oranges issues. And then the third is I really, I, there is something about choice that is not being captured in settlement malpractice cases. And I get why it's not being captured in litigation because litigation does not have at its foundation notions of autonomy and choice, right? We, we instead think very hard and long and to the great displeasure of a lot of 1Ls about things like personal jurisdiction, right? The ability of the state, of the government to control some action, that is not based on some notion of choice, it's based on power, right? And the legitimate exercise thereof. But it's not based on consent except in one very narrow Penoyer-ish way. And if you just had like flashbacks, sorry. Um, we are leaving clients with lip service about lawyers valuing clients' choices if we say, but if I take it from you, I owe you nothing. That is an odd notion of valuation. Um, Look, I don't, I don't fetishize the, a tort-based malpractice system. There are a bunch of problems with the way tort-based systems work, not just in legal context, but in medical context. There are a lot of really good principled policy objections to malpractice systems as uh, the dominant, or certainly as the only mechanism for assuring the quality of professional services. But I can't intuit that we're doing the right thing to have malpractice utterly absent from the landscape. I mean, it may be that, that there's more to be done with education, there's more to be done with markets and reputations. It may be, there are a lot of different ways to try to get at, but I just can't see that, that malpractice should be as absent as it is. And, and my greatest hope is not really that we start suing a bunch of lawyers, but that we that we start talking about the prospect that lawyers might sometimes make bad client harming decisions in the context of settlement and thinking about what we might do collectively about that system. That's the paper. Um, thank you. And I'd love to, uh, to trade ideas. So, uh, question. Okay. Given that the court system judges who were lawyers and the bar uh, focuses on stuff like this. How realistic is it for your points to become part of education for I, It's a great question. Um, I have had the good fortune to present these ideas in various states of draftiness um, uh, over the last several months, and I will say that the reception among um, 
among people who study this, among academics and among judges, has been overwhelmingly favorable. And my reception with um, uh, attorneys associations has been um, less so. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I think that they probably viscerally experience some of the complexities that I gloss over about things like um, about things like attaching probabilities to litigation. It's just brutally, brutally difficult. And so I want to be respectful of some of their objections. I don't have an agenda that says, here, pass this statute. And that's all we need. I think it is quite likely that we can get these kinds of conversations into legal education. I think we can pump the brakes on some of the logic that courts are using. In some jurisdictions, I will go so far as to say it is, I don't know if any of you are from, it, uh, from Pennsylvania, but indefensible lines that they have drawn in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, most jurisdictions are sincerely wrestling with this. And I think that there is an opportunity, especially as we contemplate the potential impacts of things like big data, what would we do with information that permitted more aggregated comparison so that we had more confidence about whether something fell within the parameters of a reasonable outcome? Might that change our willingness to engage in what has historically been a purely speculative exercise? Maybe, right? Might we start to see as negotiation research continues We've been at this now for some decades, and it is certainly not the case that negotiation research is at any risk of being able to say, if you offer 30 on a Tuesday, it will always produce a better outcome than if it's a Wednesday. Plainly, that's not there. But we know a lot more about how human beings make decisions, and I am not convinced that we are incapable of learning what doesn't work. I think we have spent 50 years trying to figure out what works, and that proves to be a very difficult bar. What if research asked a different question? What if instead the question were the negative? Are we really incapable of saying, look, I don't know whether this or that or the other is the optimum, but that is stinky bad as an approach to settlement? I think there may be opportunities there. The third and, and last thing I'll say is I think particularly here, Lawyers are enjoying a temporary, paper-free existence. Our brethren and sisters in the medical profession used to see a patient, tell them what they tell them, and unless it involved a prescription, it never got written down. I'm overstating a little, but only barely. Legal advice to clients in all but some very narrow contexts is still a lawyer said, client said, he said, she said sort of a thing that amps up the costs of a, a, a malpractice claim because one can imagine a number of clients thinking, potentially correctly, who's going to believe me? if my lawyer says that she said the thing, but I know what I heard. Even one of the cases that I led the article with uh, involved a lawyer who told his client, um, you'd be a fool to accept that million dollar offer. I'm not allowed to write down a guarantee, but I'm telling you it's a one in a million chance you don't do better. And of course she lost. I'm not allowed to write it down isn't wholly persuasive. Anyway, so I think that, that, that I am more optimistic than I may be sounding here. I think the profession's going to keep changing. I think we may even enjoy some of the changes. Not sure. What else? So in the 1% or the 1.5%, yeah. you from that, you pull these three cases that I think we could characterize as false negatives, right? They, they should have been more consequences to the lawyer and, and there weren't. 
Yeah. In that 1% or 1.5%, did you run across any cases that you might characterize as false positives where the lawyer um, acted appropriately, but yeah. they were uh, disciplined or, or uh, held civilly liable for something that was reasonable behavior in negotiation? It's a great question, and, and I want to uh, start by saying uh, many of my colleagues would not join me in characterizing these as false negatives. They think, um, at, at least I have some colleagues who think all three came out exactly right. Um, I have others who think one or, or another of them is. There are some really hard cases. Um, and again, here's where I want to be really respectful of practicing attorneys. Because there, there are some kinds of practice that are wildly overrepresented in legal malpractice claims. Right? There are certain kinds of clients that are far more likely to bring malpractice claims than other kinds of clients in ways that I don't think are explainable by the quality of that bar or the complexity of that law that have something to do with the clients and, and the contexts in which they find themselves. Um, That, that sort of point one. An example from the civil side is that um, uh, divorce cases are far more likely to produce legal malpractice claims um, than, than almost all other kinds of civil practice. There are certain kinds of property claims about which the, the rate is even higher. But, but you're far more likely to get sued for legal malpractice if you're doing divorce cases than if you are doing commercial leases, even though the dollars are would suggest that it would be more profitable to go after commercial leases. The place where it is put in highest relief is in the criminal context. Right? And it, that is the only context in which the US Supreme Court has spoken on these issues directly. There's been a line of cases in the criminal context that have come out having to do with adequacy of representation. Adequacy of representation in the context of plea agreements, right? So the, 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 the criminal corollary to this one is the lawyer who says, go ahead and plead to this, you won't get deported. And then they get deported. There the court said, well, that's not okay. That does not satisfy the constitutionally guaranteed requirement of adequate representation. And I think just reading that criminal case on its own, I at least would say, well, yeah, that's, that's terrible lawyering. How do you juxtapose that with this case? Well, this case, well, And in a funny, I don't want to overstate this, but in a funny way, you wind up with a case where it's easier to commit a constitutional violation than to be held civilly liable. <laughs> That's a little weird. But those happen in plea bargaining context. And, and the places, and I tried, I, these I limited to um, civil malpractice cases, which doesn't mean they didn't include criminal cases because one can sue one's criminal attorney in, for civil malpractice, it, it is not as overwhelmingly common as claims of inadequate representation for the, for the very understandable reason that the remedy most criminal defendants are looking for in the context of alleged legal malpractice is getting out of jail, which is not a civil remedy, at least in the classic legal malpractice sense. So the, the answer is, yeah, I saw some things where I thought, oh gosh, I might have done that. I might have advised that. Um, Every one that I can think of involved a he said, she said. Where what I found myself agreeing with is what the lawyer said she did. Which isn't necessarily what the lawyer did. And I, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a hand over here. I'm sorry, I'll let you call up to Charlie. Yeah, well, sorry, sorry. Sorry. So, Pat, you have to... Okay, um, well, I guess 
I had a question about the ethics cases that yeah. you looked at. Were those cases in which discipline was imposed, or the, were those cases also involved dismissals or probably cause findings? I and mean, we have a two-level system here in Connecticut. I'm sure the states are different in terms of how those are handled. Love that question. We wrestled really hard with how to deal with this, because this is really apples and oranges. Both of these have a couple of shared features. One is these almost certainly dramatically underrepresent the number of times clients are unhappy with their lawyers or a lawyer might have done. These are only times when clients have gone so far as to raise a complaint in one context or another. And they almost, this one almost certainly, and this one absolutely positively certainly, overrepresents the likelihood of success of a client bringing it. Because in many jurisdictions, you never get the published opinion until there's a finding against the lawyer. So I'm only reading the successful ones. In other states, and there aren't very many, um, the complaint is published after some um, minimum bar and then the resolution. And it sounds like Connecticut is one, and I didn't remember that that was true. We have a funny system because in Connecticut, the file is public if there's a probable cause finding. Okay. If there's a grievance, it goes to a reviewing panel for a probable cause finding. Yeah. If okay. there's a probable cause finding in Connecticut, the file is public but not published. So the only way you know about it is if you know go to the grievance committee and look at the file. And then after the probable cause finding, if the case is later dismissed, the case is not published. And if there is a discipline issued either by agreement or after a contested hearing, then the case is published. And if you could research the grievance decisions on the Connecticut Judicial Branch website, or power to you, first of all. Um, and so that's when you would maybe see yeah. if you could find the cases. And a lot of them are decided in Connecticut under 2.1. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so that that's what you would easy. see in Connecticut. So that's what. So we we only looked at the final. Uh, only looked at published in the jurisdictions that we studied, which means they all involve some, at least partial finding against the attorney. Um, uh, none of the states, at least I don't think any of the states that I looked at, published findings for attorneys. They only publish when the attorney is being sanctioned in some way. We did put together an electronic database. Uh, we, this one, purely my research assistants, and I employed a small army of them, because lots of states will tell you aggregated data. No state that we found, with one exception, that was Wisconsin, actually provides searchable databases in a way that would permit the kind of research that I will do. It will permit you to research an attorney. Right? You get their bar number, you can go look up that attorney. What you can't do is ask the question, how many attorneys have been complained against in the last year for failing to set up the joint account correctly? How many attorneys can't ask? So what we did was we created the database. We went in and we pulled every number, created, it, it's terabytes. So it's just, it's a, it's a jaw-dropping database. Um, and then ran our searches on that. And the researcher in me was super excited to have done it. It wasn't a lot of value for the work that, I mean, I'm just being candid. It was, it was a lot of data that I now have. I did the same thing with a lot of the ethics opinions, although those tend to be published more. But yeah, the answer is, this was um, negative findings against the lawyers was essentially my database there, which is why I say it over-represents the likelihood of success. Here's a question. Yeah. Um, so for these three cases that, were they, they were civil claims, these right? Were all so for the ethics committee, are there, did you see a number of cases that although, like where an ethics complaint could move forward for removal of client choice, where a civil complaint may not, like are there any ethical yeah. implications for removing a client choice even though there's no dollar value put towards them? It's clear in every articulation, whether it's model code or model rule, that lawyers have a duty to preserve not just choice, but informed choice. And so there are at least theoretical consequences for attorneys who violate that aspect of the model rules or model code or their state equivalent of it. 
I found very few examples of cases hitting both databases. Um, at the risk of a Civ Pro flashback, there are far fewer estoppel opportunities than you might intuit, given that there are identical facts, because the standards are different and because the procedures are different. And so there's not the piggybacking opportunity that you sometimes see, for example, between criminal cases and civil wrongs, right, where you, you wait for the criminal to happen, then you, you grab the, the results of that criminal case and then preclude relitigation in the civil case. There isn't the same opportunity between ethics complaints and, and, um, and uh, legal malpractice. And I will confess, uh, I didn't know I sort of made the assumption, I was wrong, just to be super clear, I was super wrong. Um, I assumed that if a lawyer got sanctioned by the bar for violating a canon of legal ethics, or a code or a rule or whatever your state has, that that would uh, that that would mean that that lawyer would have committed legal malpractice that the civil case against that lawyer would be easy, at least as to the breach of a duty. I mean, heck, the legal codes were right there, I thought. There it is, and it turns out, no. <clears throat> you can violate, I'm not urging it, I'm saying what, if a lawyer were to violate a, uh, one of the rules of legal ethics, she might yet successfully be able to turn around and defend a legal malpractice action on that very conduct because of the way our tort system is set up. Um, for, for some detailed reasons I'm happy to talk about, but that's, that was shocking to me. So I share, you should all be shocked about other things, not that, I, I got to be shocked about that one. I didn't know, I had no idea. <laughs> Shelly, did you have a question? Um, yes, so uh, you might already answer, but I was just wondering to what extent the malpractice lawsuits um, at least include as a baseline for their discussion the ethical uh, rules of professional there, it, uh, that would be an empirically answerable question. I didn't code for that. I was, again, shocked. I'm easily shocked, I guess. I don't know. Um, which may just speak to the profoundness of my ignorance going into this. Um, it was very uncommon that in the context of these legal malpractice cases, the question of whether the conduct satisfied or did not the legal ethics rules, very uncommon for that to be part of the court's disposition of the matter. They really went through very classic tort analyses. Did you breach a duty? And that would really be the only place that might come in, but really, they were mostly talking about agency law. Did it cause, was there damage? Is it compensable? Very classic stuff. Breach of duty is the only place it got discussed. But most of the time, they didn't need to because things like tell client about offer is so obviously unlitigable. If your defense is, well, I didn't have to tell them about that offer. I actually did find one case where that was the, the, the claim was, um, so it was, a, it was a, um, a man who worked in the shipyards and was injured on a ship and uh, injured very, very badly, brought a claim against the ship owner. The ship owner's attorney presented a $90,000 offer to the lawyer of the injured sailor. The lawyer for the injured sailor didn't tell the client about the offer. Uh, went to trial, the guy lost, got nothing. Turned around, sued his lawyer for not telling. The lawyer said $90,000 was such a paltry sum, it wasn't worth conveying. This was a man who was rendered quadriplegic, there was no way he was gonna accept the deal. Um, this went up to the First Circuit, and the First Circuit spent all of their time arguing about 
whether in the malpractice action the client stood to recover $90,000 or $60,000 because the lawyer was owed a third under the contingent fee. And the First Circuit said $60,000. I don't know the the the, the last lit, the last piece of uh, paper trail on that particular case was the First Circuit pronouncement that the sum that the, the maximum that the sailor could recover in a legal malpractice action would be the unknown about that's not a word but the the offer that was never conveyed minus the contingent fee that the lawyer who never conveyed it was owed. I, again, y'all haven't had enough caffeine or you're grouchy or something, right? It's easy to sort of, now I do want to say, um, I forget what the name of it is, but there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a psychological, if you have a long conversation with someone who has spent years doing ride-alongs with cops. You will have a different conversation than you will have if you spend your time talking with somebody who has spent years representing home insecure people and injured. You're going to have a very different, different view of the world if you do um, work all day long with survivors of domestic violence. If you expose yourself to the same pattern of things over and over, there is a great risk that you will oversee that pattern, right? Whatever it is, in whatever political direction, this isn't a political comment, that's just sort of how we are baked. We take our data and we aren't great at extrapolating its commonality. I say that to acknowledge, I just spent a year of my life on this planet reading stories about horrible lawyers. Right, and so I, I acknowledge that, that I, I, I am at risk of viewing through a lens that, that is not inaccurate but is incomplete. Right? Because my data set, the data to which I exposed myself, are not happy stories. And again, to go back to where I began, that was intentional because I've spent 20 years studying happy stories. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm pro-lawyer, it turns out. Right? I'm pro-settlement, it turns out. But it just seemed to me like it was important for me also to understand that other aspect. So I have a question. You've hinted at this, but um, you, know, you talked about how the legal malpractice system is looking at this through the lens of lawyer as litigator. Right. So how would you describe legal education today? Would you describe legal education as also making that same mistake of looking at future lawyers as lawyers as litigators? Or do you see some, you know, some recognition that we are, as you say, in the age of settlement, where in fact lawyers will have to be really good negotiators. And perhaps negotiation will be just as important as taking a course in constitutional law or civ pro, um, you know, because it's so fundamental to you know, what a lawyer does, whether you're a transactional lawyer or a litigating lawyer. I mean, you negotiate all. So I just kind of curious, you know, you've looked at this for years. You've been a dean of a law school. You've actually done some interesting things, I know, at, at Oregon. Um, you know, so what's your take on, on that? I, th I think that legal education does a better job than advertised at preparing lawyers for the complex reality that is modern practice. We are not perfect, holy moly, we're not perfect, but I think that there is a too easily knocked over straw man vision of legal education that is a generation old, where one could credibly say, I graduated from law school never having actually seen a complaint. It didn't take hard work. 
I just am not sure that would happen. I, uh, today, I, I don't want to overstate it, but I think that there are, well, I know as a, just as a, as a data matter, um, two generations ago, as, as, as late as the early 1980s, there were only, I think the number is six, law schools in this country that taught a class on negotiation and ADR. Today, the number of the 200 law schools in this country, the number that don't teach a class on negotiation or ADR is zero. Some do more than others, but I'm just not sure that it's the case that law schools do in as badly as I think fairly it, uh, we might once have been criticized for doing. I think that the market is demanding to, to the great consternation of all of us associated with legal education, whether consumers or suppliers, the market is demanding graduates that have a sort of breathtakingly broad skill set. And I think that settlement-related skills Negotiation, litigation analysis, some of the advising things, some of the deal making things and related ancillary, you know, dealing with human beings and psychology. There's all kinds of stuff baked into this. Um, I can't think of any law schools that aren't at least trying. They're just trying to do a lot of other things too. Um, and so I, 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 I like us better than we were. We are probably less good at it than we will be a generation from now, but I, I think the arc is a positive one. And I actually am optimistic about this as well. I, I can think of no profession that has sustainably insulated itself from accountability so effectively as lawyers. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I think, I mean, even, even so, so, so where are the, some of the cracks going to appear? Um, uh, you know, like I said, big data may change some of the difficulty. A specialized practice areas may change some of this, right? Settlement council didn't exist a generation ago. Collaborative law didn't exist a generation ago. There are kinds of practice where the notion of a singular, a unitary law degree being everything you need to be every kind of lawyer to everyone, that I think is unlikely to persist. And if what we see develop out of the legal profession is something more in the nature of specialized practice, now at least you've got the breach part easier to demonstrate. Because part of what happens in all of these legal malpractice cases is the plaintiff has to demonstrate that what the lawyer did is not what other lawyers do. Right? You have to demonstrate that this was out of the ordinary and it becomes a lower standard of care, right? So if you have a higher standard of care because you have self-advertised, for example, as settlement counsel, you can't turn around and say, so, well, I, what do I know about settlement? You just advertised yourself as settlement counsel, right? And so I think there may be, those might be a couple of opportunities for that. Sure. Um, so I want to separate that part of the board over there mm -hmm. um, from the rest of it. Good. The rest of it, um, I get, where you are, right? Um, and you looked at these cases and you saw in them uh, an inadequate uh, recognition of the flaws in lawyer behavior in negotiation. I'm, I'm wondering about the data you started with, Michael, and the surprise you professed about this less than 1% and less than 1.5%. Um, because it seems to me that in something like a uh, settlement, the quality of the settlement, the wisdom of the settlement is not something we ought to measure through big data. So be careful what we wish for. Uh, yeah. It's in the client. It resides in the client, in the client's satisfaction. And so I'm wondering whether the difference between the 1% the 1.5% and the other 99 or 98.5% is not so much the lawyers, it's the clients. And that clients who settle are clients who are satisfied. Yeah. 
and so you you know you're tr you're sort of trying to draw out a failure in a situation that the client maybe does not perceive to be a failure. D do you understand my, my concern do. about that? Yeah. Le the potential disconnect or the overclaiming from these per these statistics. If I were claiming that, um, yeah, I think it would be easy to make a claim I, I am not trying to make. It may, it may have come out differently. Some percentage of lawyers' activities are doing things about which then clients might complain that have nothing to do with satisfaction levels, right? It's, it's uh, did you commingle funds? Did you return my phone calls? Did you, like, there are things. That... I am skeptical that this is the right percentage in part because sometimes people are just happy with the outcome. Cognitive dissonance alone would suggest I'm a smart person, I hire smart people, I agreed to this deal, it must be a good deal, right? There are lots of pathways that would permit us, maybe falsely from an outside perspective, to be happy. As an order of magnitude matter though, I don't think that could account for an extra digit, which is what I was expecting. I think that could account for part of the story, but in a medical malpractice context or in a therapeutic malpractice context, one of the things we're really concerned about is invisible harm, right? The client, the patient who was harmed but doesn't know she was harmed. Right? We worry about that in that context, and I'm not sure why we wouldn't worry about it here, especially if part of the reason they're happy is ignorance, right? If the, if the malpractice is actually about settlement advice, then their happiness should not be our gauge. It would be my, my, my sort of facile pushback, at least. Now, we've hit the uh, 130 mark. Um, so, you know, but uh, Professor Moffat will be here for you know, a few more minutes if you want to talk, ask your questions privately. But I just want to thank uh, all of you for taking time out. And also, I think we should really uh, all this gentleman who flew all the way across the country, Oregon, uh, and got into his hotel at 1.30 last night. Does it show? <laughs> he was smiling and, and talking to him. So give me, give me a hand for it. Thank you all.